fabulous show. Alaska. I heard be Alaska. It's hard. <laughs> Alaska. Pull up a chair and enjoy the show. You can hear it from Sitka to Barrow. Gather around for genius show. It's the alley. and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska. Native news and native information, I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so much for joining us. Today we visit the Athabascan village of Chitna, Alaska, a village whose land claims still remain unsettled. I'll be back with Chitna right after this. Hi, my name is Keaton Shepard, and I live in Chitna, Alaska, and I love Heartbeat Alaska. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Brown's Electric Lighting Gallery. Thank you, Brown's Electric, for your generous support of Heartbeat Alaska. Heartbeat Alaska is made possible by Kupik Carlisle Transportation, your full-service transportation and logistics company. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. Land ownership, land trespassing, has always been a major issue for Native and non-Native alike. And today, we travel north to the Athabascan village of Chitna. People have relied on this fishery for thousands of years. There have been people fishing here at Chitna for well over a hundred years, um, not just uh, native peoples. We had our gates crashed, I had guns pulled on me. We've had a couple of kids almost killed. One was knocked off his bike and his bike was thrown in the ditch. As with any group, there's always a few that do things that make the rest look bad. Quite a few other native elders had camps. Camps got shot up, their fish wheels cut loose, pretty much just ran off the property. For thousands of years, the Atna people lived in the broad valley of the Copper River. The fish, animals, and plants in this valley provided everything they needed. The natives here made use of the copper they found in the Wrangell Mountains. By the early 1900s, word of the huge copper deposits in the area was out, and a railroad was going in. By 1938, over $100 million worth of ore had been extracted. The mine and the railroad were both abandoned when the ore was gone. The village of Chitna went from a bustling town full of miners to a quiet backwater filled with ghosts. In 1959, the federal government quietly transferred the railroad right-of-way to the state to be used as a future highway. I don't know, like I said, what year the railroad came, but that's when it became a road. So that's why I think the ancestors have the right-of-way, because they were here way before the railroad. Could you see that real well, that mm -hmm. cabin over there? Meet Billy and Millie Buck. 
Like many Atna people, they have a fish camp on the Copper River near Chitna. Camps like this used to be more common around Chitna. But just about the time the old railroad became a highway, dip net fishing was beginning to become popular. The same Copper River salmon that fed the Atna people for millennia was now becoming famous. Unfortunately, so were some of the best fishing spots. There when Kitty Johns and quite a few other native elders had camps down throughout um, O'Brien and Healy and Escalita camp there. We had different fish wheels up and down that river. Different elder families had spots there. And back in the late 60s, their camps got shot up. Their fish wheels cut loose. Pretty much just ran off the property. And that's when the fishers all came in and started. Though they were catching the same fish, these new fishermen were very different from the Atna people. Our people have relied on this fishery and it's been a mainstay of our food for thousands of years. I don't think they rely on it as much as we do. Um, I'm not saying that they don't use it and then it's not important to them, it is, but it isn't, doesn't have the same um, customer tradition use as the Otten people. The trespassers make us very angry because they dirty our lands. There's tissue paper all over the place. There's guns being drawn. There's fish being taken and guts are left on the bank to rot and smell. When we cut our fish, we even use the backbone. It's our survival. It feeds our kids. It feeds our families. It provides for our animals, because we don't waste nothing. In 1971, the Alaska Native Land Claims Settlement Act gave the Atta people title to thousands of acres along the Copper River, including those great fishing spots. End of story, right? Wrong. The dip netters were determined to find a way to the river, and they did. Remember that old railroad bed that was eventually going to be a highway? Well, it's a dirt road now, but since it was designated as a highway, it's technically 300 feet wide. This area is called the right-of-way. The idea is to leave room for possible expansion of the road for later as the road now called O'Brien Creek Road snakes its way south from town along the river. That 300-foot right-of-way sometimes goes right to the river. And there's one more exception to the land claims of the Atna and Chitna Native Corporations. In Alaska, most waterways big enough for a boat are called navigable and are open to the public. The area open to the public includes everything below the mean high water mark. To put it simply, the beaches and gravel bars alongside the river are also open to the public. Welcome to O'Brien Creek, one of the most popular spots for dip netters on the Copper River. Here, the road opens onto this gravel bar, so dip netters can drive directly from the right-of-way to the riverbed. Currently, we're standing right in the center of the road that brings you from Chitna down to O'Brien Creek and further on down to Haley Creek and, and uh, Escalita Creek. This is the state of Alaska's right-of-way claim. They, have, they say they have 300 feet, 150 feet from each side of the center of this road. They have, a, they have gone through with the surveyor and surveyed the center line of the road and have put it on a map. They've also taken and surveyed the edge of the Copper River, and that's meandering the river, to establish where the high water mark is on that river. And <clears throat> anything upland of that high water mark is considered private property up to the point of the right of way. That's 150 feet from the center line where we're standing currently. And the average person can just estimate distance, uh, the average footstep for a human being of an average height, about five foot, 10 inches tall or so, the average footstep is about three feet long. So <clears throat> just taking and estimating uh, 150 feet being approximately 50 steps. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take from this point, pace off 100 or 50 steps, pardon me, and go a couple extra steps and show you where the line is outside of the right of way. <clears throat> One. Joe Hart spent years working for the Chitna and Atna tribes. 
He sees a big problem these dip netters seem to be unaware of. 49.50. This is approximately 150 feet from that point where we started at. And if we were to take just an extra step or two just to make sure we're over that line, we are currently standing on private property. This is Chittenden Native Corporation land, and the same thing can be done at Escalita Creek and at, at Haley Creek. All of these people in all of these vehicles behind us are trespassing at this point. They do not have the private property owner's permission to be here. So who cares if a few people park their cars here to go fishing? Oh, yeah. The people who call Chitna home care. We, we love to see the fishermen. We love to see the um, tourists, but um, you have to watch out for people who are driving down from Chitna, you know, down from Fairbanks to Chitna after working all day, and they're tired, and then they get here and usually party some and um, dip for their fish, and when they get their limit or, you know, they get their fill of their beer, then they hop in their trucks and drive back up. And sometimes they're pulling um, campers. Um, a lot of time they're pulling boats, and they're exhausted, and they're very dangerous, and they almost never recognize our signs. We've had a couple of kids almost killed. Um, one was knocked off his bike, and his bike was thrown in the ditch. Um, and if they'd recognize and, and respect the law and go 30 miles an hour or slower, then it would be better. The location with the fishermen is they all set up camps down there with campfires, and we have nothing but dry woods that from, geez, for miles, and then all the wind blows in our direction towards Chitna, which is a bad scenario. If there's ever a fire that gets out of hand on that side, it's going to blow right through here, which what we're afraid of. Every year, there's there's more and more coming. They're bringing more and more four wheelers, more and more boats, but they're leaving more and more trash behind. So why not just post no trespassing signs? Everybody says we don't see no signs, and if you look around, you'll see the signs posted all over on the trees, and they use that for a campground, and that's trespassing on private property there. Yeah, they take off the signs and. That way they can say they've never seen them before. Dan Stevens lives here in Chitna. You might say he and his little Subaru are on the front lines of the fight to protect native lands. We went with him to meet some of the people who come here every year to dip net for Copper River salmon. We're at O'Brien Creek. Um, right now we're we're on high water, high mean water, which means the state owns this park, according to them. Up over in this area down here is where the old Copper River, Copper old Copper River Railroad came across here. But this is our access road to go down. Oh, man, you might as well go to the Sears Mall and look for a place to park if you get here, like on Fourth of July or a good sunny, a good weekend or something. You'll be trying to get into a shopping mall, parking spots. We see people camped in the state's right-of-way, right up against the edge of Chitna land. Things look pretty tame while we're there, and we meet a man who simply calls himself Ace. Okay. Uh, bottom line, we just have a trailer that we got set up to where we can move it quickly with the food to go down in the water where they can stand up and clean their fish. They don't have to bend over in the creek. That way it's not... There's been people falling in the river here and drowning trying to clean their fish. Ace brings his fish cleaning trailer here every year. It's parked in an area Chittenden Native Corporation says is theirs. Still, Ace sees himself as part of the solution, not part of the problem. Before, uh, every time somebody make a fling or just have to leave guts on the rocks or something like that, and the birds would be fighting over it, dragging it all over the place. Well, this would be solid fish heads and fish guts. A lot of times it's mainly from the birds that pick them up and do it, but since we're down here, I don't like the, I don't like the smell of it myself, so yeah, we go around in the morning or in the evening when we're not busy or something like that. What stuff they do drag up now, which is a lot less than it used to be, but the last two years in a row there hadn't been a bear problem down here either, and that was another concern. 
Oh, I don't make a lot of money at all. I don't make hardly anything. I try to help out a couple of uh, disabled vets in the past besides myself. And then, like I said this year, I've got one homeless gentleman that did not want to go on welfare or anything like that. He'd rather come down here and maybe clean some fish for some people for tips or something. No, you're not going to get rich quick down here to doing the fish cleaning, that's for sure. This is Mark Ham. He does make money down here. He runs a charter boat service, essentially sort of a water taxi that brings dip netters to some of the best fishing spots around. Well, for the past 20 years, uh, this will be the 21st year, um, I've had a charter business down here, operated on the Copper River. Uh, I basically take state residents who qualify uh, to go dip netting in the uh, personal use fishery here out and uh, drop them off along the bank and uh, they catch their fish and flag them down when they're ready and come back. Um, well, I believe that there is no strip of land there that is actually uh, above the high water mark where people have access on DNR land. From the right of way, the old Copper River Northwestern Railway uh, down here to the Copper River at O'Brien Creek. And um, the uh, state of Alaska, uh, through our legislature, also believes that there is uh, no trespass that happens within that uh, section. That's why they did away with the $25 fees. As with any group, there's always a few that do things that make the rest look bad, whether it's shooting signs on the highway, um, leaving garbage, doing inappropriate activities. I do know uh, in the 20 years that I've been here in Chitna that um, a lot of things happen from the local peoples. The dip netters, for the most part, the majority of them, uh, really respect this resource, and they use these fish to feed their families and they pack their garbage out. They're very respectful of the property around. Um, and, you know, they're willing to do what they need to do. And like I said, there's always a few that don't do that, but you're gonna find that anywhere. Like most of the dip netters we met, Mark wants this resource and the lands around here to be respected. Like the folks in Chitna, He'd like to find a way for dip netters and local subsistence users to get along. There are legitimate concerns on both sides, but I believe that uh, um, there are ways to work those concerns out. And putting roadblocks up or threatening people uh, is just not an appropriate matter by which to do those things. But roadblocks are just what the people of Chitna are about to resort to. So what would happen if the Chitna Native Corporation simply blocked off their property at O'Brien Creek? When Heartbeat Alaska returns, we'll find out. Vietnam veteran, roughneck, small businessman, family man, governor, independent, effective leader. Tony Knowles. In Washington, he'll work to create jobs, reach across party lines to promote oil and gas development, make prescription drugs and health care more affordable, even standing up to his own party to protect Alaska jobs. Putting Alaska first, Tony Knowles. I'm Tony Knowles, and I approve this message to Alaskans. For years, a portion of O'Brien Creek Road crossed Chitna land, and after many years of watching trespassers go by, the villagers decided to do something about it. Back in 1985 and 86, the Chitna Native Corporation did block O'Brien Creek Road. They put up a gate and charged the public $15 a person or $25 per family to cross their land. David Finnison recalls working at the gate. A lot of people didn't agree with that. Um, we had our gates crashed. I had guns pulled on me. It was an intimidating situation where neither one of us won. I mean, there wasn't managed right. 
that's why the fee came into place later on down the road. DOT came in, punched the road in a few years later and abolished that fee and then we worked on a settlement. That's right. The state received so many complaints about the gate and the fee, they actually realigned O'Brien Creek Road so it no longer crossed any native lands. At that point, the village of Chitna worked out a deal with the state. The fee for the fishermen was to, for the trash collection, for the outhouses, and for the cleanup that we do down there. From 1991 to 2003, fishermen had to pay 10 to $25 for a permit to fish near Chitna. The state gave most of the money to Atna Incorporated and the Chitna Native Corporation as compensation for the trespass. Some of the money also went to the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Chitna Native Corporation used the money to place dumpsters and outhouses on O'Brien Creek Road. They also were able to hire someone from the village to clean up. For many years, it was Dan Stevens. And in 19, the early 90s, I was doing the campgrounds, and this is where they'd have the dumpsters, and the dumpsters would be piled with garbage because we couldn't get service down here quick enough to empty all the garbage. No, it wasn't really a great situation, but it was better because we could we were able to pay someone to go up and down the street here and pick up the garbage that the people had just left on the sides of the roads. In 2003, the state paid $100,000 to resurvey the O'Brien Creek Road's right-of-way, hoping to settle the dispute. And in 2004, they stopped collecting the fee from fishermen, and instead, the state took over the trash pickup and outhouses. It took them until late June to get them in place. So now Chitna is receiving no compensation for trespass. Yet, as we saw, there are people trespassing. So what choices does Chitna have? Well, if there's a trespass issue and we call the troopers, there's a not lot they can do for it. Um, they want to know how serious the incident is, whether it's a life-threatening incident or not. You know, like I said, I've had guns pulled on me. We've reported that. Um, I'd never seen a trooper that day. No, I couldn't tell you. Apparently he didn't shoot me, so it wasn't a serious matter. Well, we've gone through all of the, the processes that we've seen in front of us, testified to the legislature, both House and Senate. We've talked to the Dipnet Association. We've gone to the Board of Fish. We've asked them for assistance on all of this. We've talked to the Fish and Game. We've talked to the Commissioner of, of uh, DOT. We've talked to the Commissioner of Fish and Game. And everyone that's involved, we've talked to them on several occasions. When we put up the barricade and we block public access by vehicle down here and by foot, they're going to start a floodgate of complaints over why can't I go down to O'Brien Creek and do the, the dip netting that I'm used to? Why can't, why is that? And then they're going to have to be educated. Another shot of O'Brien Creek, private property, no trespassing, posted by CNC. Just in time for the July 4th weekend, Chitna did put up barricades around their land, blocking off most of the O'Brien Creek area. These chunks of concrete did greatly reduce trespassing. As for Mark, he lost around half of his summer business. I would just uh, like to say that it's unfortunate that Alaskans have to argue and squabble over a resource that uh, belongs to all Alaskans. And um, most Alaskans are good people. They like to work with other people. Um, we have uh, put out our hand before in the past, and, and we do now, to try and um, sit down and talk to bridge this gap uh, without a lot of threats or innuendos or anything like that to see if there is some way we can rectify the situation. Uh, unfortunately, I believe there's uh, an unwillingness to do that on the part of the corporations. Still, the dip netters want to find a solution that is good for everyone. And I don't think there'd be anybody around down here uh, anywhere that would complain about paying the fee to set up a camp. And that, uh, I think 
the only thing that I've heard from some people in personal opinions is they they would rather it not be a handout, but they, they would rather it be a work together type thing. Remember Dan Stevens and his trusty Subaru. He worked very hard to create this. When the Chitna Native Corporation decided to open an RV park, Dan Stevens got out his tools and went to work. Our water for now. And these are the first customers. Dan is hoping that this will relieve some of the crowding around O'Brien Creek and other areas. But it's also much more. This little patch of land could mark a shift in the way Chitna deals with the influx of thousands of fishermen each summer. <laughs> Folks around here will watch this place carefully to see if the dip net fishery could be a boost to Chitna's economy instead of a strain. Hello, I'm Dan Stevens from Chitna, Alaska. Heartbeat Alaska will return. This winter, the village of Chitna, the Dip Notice Association, and the state of Alaska are going to sit down at the same table. And it'll be the first time that all three have sat down at the same table to debate this problem. And we certainly hope they find a solution. I'd like to remind you to vote. No matter what village you live in, even if you're in Anchorage, wherever, your vote counts. Stand up and, and count. Even if you don't vote, that's like voting. So please make a stand and let's vote in this next election. For everyone here, I'm Jeannie Green. God bless every single one of you. And join me next week as we travel again to remote villages in Alaska. Yeah.